Oh, you know, in 1941, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we moved within three years, within three more years to rebuild our economy to defeat Nazism and Japanese imperialism. That is exactly the kind of approach we need right Thank now. You. Lead the world. Thank you, Senator. Let's turn to another... So here we have Bernie Sanders comparing global warming and climate change to warfare. And uh, with us now we have Ian Dunlop. Welcome to the Sustainable Hour, Ian. Hi, Nick. Thanks for uh, having me on the program. And the reason we've called you is because we thought, wow, we're quite impressed with hearing a presidential candidate talking like that. These rhetorics, I've never heard a politician actually say something as strong as that. What's your initial reaction to what you have just heard? Well, exactly as you just said. I mean, this is the first time I've heard anybody politically honestly starting to talk about what the problem really is and the solution, the type of the type of speed of reaction we have to make. And Ian, maybe you should, in, uh, we haven't properly introduced you to the listeners, uh, both uh, Tony and I here, we, we know you because we've heard you speak, but uh, you have a special background because you've actually worked in the fossil fuel industry. Yes, I spent all of my, pretty much all of my career in the oil and gas exploration business and then in coal, coal ex- exploration and mining. Um, I have been involved in climate change since the 1960s because it's not new. It was on the agenda way back then. And uh, in the last 40 years or so, obviously, the science has got clearer and clearer. The evidence has become clearer and clearer. And we are now at the point where we have to move and do something very urgent, just as Bernie Sanders is saying. So this whole talk about the alarmist, you know, Tony and I, we are often being called alarmist, cry wolf is the response that, you know, we get when we go out and talk like that, and that we need to move with urgency? Well, look, it's not alarmist. I mean, the fact is that this is a genuine existential risk. If the global temperatures get very much above one and a half degrees C, two degrees C, then you're entering in a world that we haven't seen for millions of years. And effectively, what it means is that we're going to see a major reduction in global population. I mean, that's what the science is really telling us. And at the present time, we have about 7 billion people on the planet. The forecast is we're going to go up to around 9 billion. If we do nothing about climate change very quickly, then we're probably going to see that global population start to reduce uh, in many parts of the world because those areas will become uninhabitable. Now, this is not new stuff. I mean, this is what the science has been saying for about 15 to 20 years. The problem we have is that our political systems, both here and in uh, in Europe and the US, are incapable of actually facing up to the implications of of this issue. That's maybe until now, because now at least we have one politician in America. Well, yes, and it's one, one politician, and it's great to hear it, because finally we're getting the truth. I mean, the fact is that if you look at what's now happening around the world in terms of the hard-nosed evidence, it's pretty clear that we badly have, even the science, uh, the advanced science has badly underestimated how fast climate change is actually moving. If you look at what is occurring in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, we're facing situations where sea level may very well rise by several meters before the end of the century. And you're already seeing um, major impact in terms of heat stress and what have you in countries like India and China, as well as here, frankly. So um, it's all happening. And what we need now is some honesty to face up to this issue, these issues and, uh, and start to implement the right sort of policies. And that is not happening here at all. Neither side of politics uh, has been prepared to honestly face up to the size of the challenge and the speed of reaction we've got to make. And frankly, I don't think they ever will because we've set the system up in a way that prevents that. Um, They're all totally short-term focused, no real interest in addressing anything to do with the long term. And so we need community pressure to really change that and we need the major corporations to start to get in behind the speed of change that's necessary because... Frankly, it's in their own interest to do it. If they don't do it, we're not going to have an economy in which they can operate. Exactly. Now, when Bernie Sanders talked, did you notice the cheering? Yeah, look, to me, 
when I, I do a lot of speaking around the country and overseas on these issues, and I am getting the impression that the community has now pretty clearly recognised that we're being taken for fools by the political system. We're not being told the truth. People are getting very nervous because they can see the implications and they can see the hard-nosed impact that's already happening. And they want change. And we're not getting it from our political system. I mean, this is not a left or right-wing political issue. This is an existential issue that if we don't get it right, we all have a very big problem. And it doesn't matter what your ideology is, whether it's, you know, the Institute of Public Affairs, extreme right wing, you know, the Abbott uh, supporters or, or whatever, or the, the, the left wing of politics. This is above all of that. It's got to be addressed, you know, frankly, on a, on a bipartisan, a genuine bipartisan issue. And I think the political system basically has, um, doesn't have the capacity to actually do anything about this. I mean, we have to just move around them. Well, you say bipartisan. What if I said tripartisan in the sense that we have the Greens? And don't you think Bernie here is going to inspire at least the Greens to take up this sort of message? Oh, look, I think it goes beyond that. I mean, it, it, he's absolutely right. I mean, I've had this view for a long time and I've spoken about it, that we have to move to a war footing because the speed of change that's needed is the sort of thing that did happen, in, as he said, in the US and in Germany and in, uh, and in Britain pre-World War II, where the whole economy was turned on its head in the space of um, a year, 18 months, two years, that sort of thing, where industries were completely changed around. Now, that is the sort of response we're going to have to adopt. You can't do it just with tinkering around the edge of the political system. I think in the end, we're going to need on this, uh, as we had in you know, pre-World War II in many countries, uh, a government of national unity, where Political differences are put aside. I mean, we have got good people in politics, but they are constrained by party positions, by ideologies which are totally irrelevant in the 21st century. And we have to find a different way. I mean, I think people know that the politics is broken in this country, as it is in many other countries, particularly in the U.S. You know, money, big money has stopped uh, the real issues being addressed. And until we break that stranglehold, we're never going to solve this. So um, we need a very big change in the system. And I think getting the good people in politics together, whether they're from left or right or Greens or whatever, to really form a hardcore leadership group that is capable of actually addressing this is going to become an absolute priority. And I think in the end, that's where we'll get to. So at the moment, there's a group of uh, activists who are petitioning for a declaration of emergency, a climate well, emergency. Do you think that could be a, a, a way to approach it? Well, that's certainly um, one way of getting attention to the issue uh, as it genuinely is. I mean, I've been in a, in a, had the view of that we need an emergency response for about 10 years. Because, I mean, this is patently obvious. If you look at the science, it's been there all the time. I mean, you cannot solve this unless you've absolutely fundamentally changed the way the economy works. I mean, it's not a question of sackcloth and ashes, but it does mean that you can't use, as Bernie Sanders says, you can't use the incrementalist approach. And you've got to break some of the, the real barriers to change we've got. I mean, the, the amount of money that's being put into politics from major corporations defending their own interests, I mean, the vested interest problem, in America is enormous. I mean, the, the, you know, these campaigns are funded by the, the big, big companies, the fossil fuel industries and so on. So it's not surprising you don't get a, you know, true, true picture. We are moving the same way. I mean, our, you know, the, the, whether it be liberal or labor in this country, the same sort of problem is emerging and it completely distorts sensible government. It stops things happening. If you look at the corporate world, one of the biggest problems we have is the way people are paid. I mean, we pay people enormous amounts of money for very short-term performance, which means that they are totally disinterested in anything to do with the long term. And that's why a lot of corporations are not being prepared to face up to climate change. So the sort of change you're making in the economy is, is absolutely dramatic. And it, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, we have solutions. But you have to be honest about the size of the problem. 
um, if you want to come up with the, the right, you know, sort of solutions and the right response. And that's what we now have to do. So, Ian, when I hear you talk like that, I'm thinking, couldn't you step in? You know, uh, <laughs> no, seriously, uh, what happened at the Second World War at the time? There was a guy in England called Churchill. No one in the beginning. He's talked and talked for years about that you can't be friends with Germany. Yeah, and then there right. was a switch at some point, and suddenly people began to listen. And, you know, we, we know later on in history what happened, and Churchill became actually that person who made a radical change in England. Now, couldn't you take up that mission? Well, you know, I in, don't know that I'm I'm a Churchill stature by him, by him, I'm afraid. Well, you but have look, been it, out. It's going, well, it, it needs, there is a problem in that very few people uh, have been prepared to honestly talk about the size of the challenge we've got and the need for emergency response. I guess I'm one of them. Um, you know, people like David Spratt in Melbourne and a number of other people in Melbourne have been doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, to a degree overseas. But the trouble is there aren't very many. And most of the people um, who are doing it are not in positions of authority because uh, it, by definition, it's almost impossible. I mean, the, the organizations that If you look around the country in the, in the NGO movement, I mean, the um, the main environmental NGOs are also not honest about the size of the problem because they preferred to work with government in trying to come up with the solutions. Now, the difficulty with that is you end up having to talk within the government's framework. In other words, you can't talk about emergencies because that doesn't fit with the government's view of uh, or, or the opposition's view of what uh, you know the problem is. So a lot of the, most of the NGOs, not all of them, but almost all of them, have ruled themselves out of any sensible discussion of the problem, and they are as much a part of the uh, you know the the failure as anybody else. So we've got to get away from that. So yes, we need to get those who are prepared to talk out to get together and uh, I guess uh, try and make uh, a bigger impact, which is what we've been trying to do, but it's been an uphill battle. <laughs> so anyway, you have a proposal here from the Sustainable Hour in DeLong, Ian, directly to you, that you could take up that leadership, or at least, you know, form that group that, you know, where a group of people then find that person who could be our new climate Churchill. Well, we're going to need leaders like that, there's no question about that, and uh, certainly I'm happy to contribute what I can to do that, and we need others to join in. That's But, fabulous. You know, the starting point really has to be an honest articulation of exactly what it is we're dealing with and uh, and the implications of it. And we know all of that. I mean, it's it's clear, and we've just got to get the, uh, the you know the rest of the community and the um, corporate groups and what have you to come in behind that and get NGOs talking honestly about the problem instead of stuffing around the edge of it. The Sustainable Hour. 